Uh, today we have a great program uh, exploring one of the most infamous, infamous events in Boston history, the sale of Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees and the 86 year long drought that followed uh, before the w Red Sox won the World Series again in 2004. Uh, we have a fabulous, gr fabulous group to speak, um, and I think it'll be a fantastic program. Um, our moderator, Gordon Eads, will introduce the rest of the panel, uh, but I'll just let you know who Gordon Eads is if anyone here doesn't already know him. Uh, Gordon Eads is the official historian of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, he has been the team historian since 2015, and before that covered the Red Sox for 18 years for the Boston Globe and then ESPN. He's a good friend to the Massachusetts Historical Society, and this is actually the third program that we've done with him in the past three years. Uh, so if we do a fourth one next year, we can actually really call this a tradition. Um, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Gordon Eats. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I am just so delighted to be here. Peter, thank you so much. Um, you know, I was telling our panelists um, uh, earlier, I'm, I'm not sure we deserve a room uh, quite this uh, uh, impressive, but uh, uh, it, it's great to be here, and um, uh, I wish I could offer a plausible explanation as to why our ball club isn't performing very well so far this season, but um, as uh, Bob Ryan would tell you, it's still early, 1st of June. Uh, I want to recognize the, the great Boston Globe columnist, uh, Bob Ryan, here in the audience with us. And uh, to his right is another one of my sports writing brethren, Don Banks. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I got some fairly uh, impressive uh, guests sitting here on the, uh, at the podium on, the, on my panel. Uh, I'll start uh, from the far left, a former colleague of mine at the Boston Globe and a guy that uh, I've regarded as a, as a sports writing hero. Sorry, Lee, I, I'm sure you probably don't like to hear that, but I still carry around a column that uh, Lee wrote uh, as an early column uh, during the 1987 NBA Finals between uh, the Celtics and the Lakers. Now, if you understand the newspaper business, uh, we, the paper puts out uh, a number of editions, and the early edition would often come out before uh, the end of the game or coincide with the end of the game, so the writers would have to come up with uh, uh, oftentimes what was considered a throwaway column because it wasn't going to be in the next morning's edition uh, in the city. But Lee sat down and wrote a column uh, imagining what it would be like for uh, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson to grow old together and competing against each other in everything, right? Match game, uh, shuffleboard, uh, on and on. And it was just, it was an epic column. And to the, to the credit of the Globe editors, they realized that it was special because the next morning there was not one Lee Monfield column in the paper, but two. So. There was only one paycheck in the mail. <laughs> uh, to Lee's right uh, is a gentleman that um, I had passing acquaintance with, uh, had never really had an opportunity uh, to sit down and uh, converse at any length until last night. Uh, we had dinner here in town. Uh, John Thorne is the official historian uh, for Major League baseball. He's a prolific writer uh, on baseball history, and we're just delighted to have you here, John. Thank you. And you know, I, 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 got, I got so caught up in my flowery stuff for Lee, I forgot to mention, oh, by the way, he also wrote a book on Babe Ruth called The Big Bam. <laughs> Uh, and to my immediate left uh, is a, an extraordinary uh, journalist and author. Um, I'd have to say the Sandy Koufax book may be my all-time favorite baseball biography. That, uh, and it was authored by uh, this lady, Jane Levy, with the... Levy. I know, I did that on purpose. Did that on I did purpose? it on purpose. Okay. You're lucky I didn't right. call you... Jean Lee, earlier in the, in the day, she was telling us about one event she went to and, and they uh, killed both her, what they introduced you as? Jean? Jean 
So it was the National Book Critics Award. This is how I knew I wasn't winning. They, uh, <laughs> they, they introduced, first they gave like glowing reviews to the four other books, lo florid, long things. And then they came, and finally, Gene Levy's, uh, Gene Levy, Jane Levy's, the big fella. And I went, I lost. <laughs> so, Jane and I only know each other for the last 35 years, so I That's had to cool. do that to her. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Levy. It's okay. My grandmother went to the grave as Rachel Levy, just so you know. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. And Jane also is the author of a best-selling book on Babe Ruth called uh, The Big Fella. So, uh, as you know, the, the, the title of this program was The Sale of the Century, uh, because uh, it was 100 years ago uh, this year, uh, December 26th, uh, was when the uh, deal was made. It wasn't actually announced uh, publicly until, I believe, January 5th. Uh, and I wonder if they could have kept it secret for nine days, uh, a, a deal of that magnitude uh, today, where the um, Boston Red Sox sold uh, Babe Ruth uh, to the New York Yankees, uh, forever altering uh, the course of history uh, for two franchises. Uh, how I'd like to start today uh, is I, I would like to give uh, each member of the panel, and I'll begin with you, Jane, uh, to tell a favorite Ruth story just to give us a flavor of uh, the man we're going to be talking about today. So what happens after you write a book is that, first of all, people write you and say, you're an idiot. You got this wrong, you got that wrong, I like Montville better, you know, whatever. So, but sometimes people call and say, or show up at readings and say, hey, here's a story you should have put in the book. Sure, would, would have put it in the book if I knew it, but anyway, this guy comes up to me in Connecticut, the part of Connecticut that's Red Sox territory, and introduces himself as Peter Lowenstein. Lowenstein was um, the son of Babe Ruth's lawyer, Melvin Lowenstein, and um, he said, you know, I, the, you really should have used this one. I said, Peter, you know, there's always a paperback or something. Um, and it goes like this. Um, Babe Ruth and Lefty Gomez, who played with Ruth for the last five, four years of his career with the Yankees, um, were fast friends, which is to say they kept company and did fast things together. <laughs> and one of the things they particularly liked to do, do you know, do you know this story, Lee? You probably do. I can tell by that look. Anyway, um, they like to I go to the fight. They, well, I figure with that build up, you might know. So they like to go to the fights together. And they particularly like to go to the fights together in New Jersey. Don't ask me why, or at least I couldn't figure out why initially. And Peter says, you know, so they would go over to New Jersey and they would tell um, Claire Ruth and then Lefty's wife when he married in 1933, an actress named June O'Day. Um, that they were going to the fights, and they knew the ring announcer at this particular place, and he agreed, a priori, to announce their presence at ringside at a particular time each time they went to the fights. And of course, as soon as he announced that they were at ringside, remember, no television people, right? As soon as he announced their presence, Lefty and Ruth took off for their favorite brothel. <laughs> where they went every time somehow fisticuffs were exchanged. Those pugilists were something. Those pugilists. As somebody who's made a, a bit of a career in statistics as well as in history, let me uh, share what I think is a little known story. Right field at Fenway Park was the toughest place to hit a home run in the American League in Babe Ruth's time. In 1918, when he hit 11 home runs as a part-time pitcher, part-time outfielder, you know how many home runs he hit at home? Zero. He had been told by the coaches to employ scientific baseball, to try hitting the ball to left and to left center. He grumbled in later years that if he hadn't listened to them and he'd only swung naturally, he would have hit many more home runs. In 1919, his last year with the Red Sox, he hit 
nine home runs at Boston and 20 on the road. So when the trade came and he came to the Yankees and played at the Polo Grounds in 1920, there were people in Boston who were stunned at what an enormous figure he'd become, hitting 54 home runs, uh, what did he bat, 373, 393, I'm not recalling that number. And my view is that Babe Ruth was fully formed as a hitter in 1919, and Jacob Rupert, as an amateur sabermetrician, knew what he was getting, and the $100,000 that he paid was not $100,000 on the barrel head. It was $25,000 plus an agreement to pay an additional $25,000 in each of the succeeding three years. So Ruth sold for nothing. Um, if you look at the number of home runs he hit at home for the Yankees at the Polo Rounds in 1920, the number is 29 which meant that he hit 25 on the road. He hit 25 on the road for the Yankees. He had hit 20 on the road for the Red Sox the previous year as a part-timer. So the Yankees were really smart, or the Red Sox were really stupid, <laughs> or as we may come to explain over the course of this afternoon, desperate people will do desperate things. And Harry Frizee was desperate. I, I wrote this book about Babe Ruth and dedicated it to my grandson, um, who had just been born. He's going to be 14 in a month, so it's been a while since um, I, I, I kind of walked around Babe Ruth's life. So um, Gordon said, well, everybody's going to give an anecdote. And I said, I better go into the book and see if I can find an anecdote. And, and I've always been charmed by by the arrival of Babe Ruth in Boston, that, that he, he just comes, he, he had the, the greatest day of anybody in the history of the world. Um, and here, here's what it was. In rapid succession, according to legend, Ruth stepped off the Federal Express from Baltimore at Back Bay Station in Boston at 10 a.m. on July 11th, 1914, said goodbye to his bodyguard, went across Dartmouth Street with Ernie Shore ordered a breakfast of ham and eggs at Lander's Coffee Shop from the 16-year-old waitress he soon would marry, stopped off at the Red Sox offices on Devonshire Street, went to Fenway Park, was fitted for a uniform, was told he was going to start that afternoon against the Cleveland Naps, then pitched seven innings to record his first Major League win, 4-3. Presumably, he then ate another good meal unpacked his suitcase at the Brunswick Hotel, and slept very well that night. Who's had a better day than that? You meet your, you meet your wife, you, you come to the Red Sox, and, you know, and you're in Boston, Massachusetts, and you, you've grown up in, in, in St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, where, where the brothers have kind of kept a, a close hand on you, and now, my God, here you are in Boston, Massachusetts, walking right down Boylston Street right outside here. What could be better? Gordon, can I add something Absolutely. to what John said? John, of course, I defer to John in everything statistical and historical, which is why he vetted the book, and that's why Buck O'Neill's name is misspelled, right, John? That's my right? fault. That's your fault. Anyway, one of the things about Ruth in 1918. It was Buck O'Neill, right? Yeah, that was it, Buck. Yeah. Um, there were only 235 home runs hit in Major League Baseball, which did not become Major League Baseball until 1969, correct? Um, not officially. Thank correct. you. Okay. Um, and of those, the statistics um, were done for my book by a guy named Michael Halpert, who is a genius in economics and the economics of baseball, and particularly how the sale of Babe Ruth created the evil empire. But one of the statistics he did for me, which I absolutely love, is that you are more likely to have known one of the American survivors of the sinking of the Titanic than to have seen a home run in 1918. So when people ask how much he changed the game and how, you know, to what degree, it's, it's, it's in that simple sentence. I mean, it was, it was unheard of. It was a, you know, it was a, you know, usually inside the park 
home run kind of deal, like the one he gave up in the 1916 World Series? 15? Yes. 16, right. Thank you. <laughs> you. You know, I mean, you think about it, like any one of us, and just watching a, a, a baseball tonight or, or uh, watching ESPN Sports Center sees more home runs, more great plays in one hour than our parents saw in their entire lives, you know? I mean, people, people didn't see, I mean, we have just such an influx of great plays that come at us one after the other, and, and nobody even kind of nods at that fact. It's, it's just part of life now, Yeah, well, but one, it wasn't then. One of the things about baseball is that every smart guy knows that while there were Nat Lajewais and Hannes Wagners and Ty Cobbs, players today are better than they were then. Players of every generation have been better than those of the succeeding generation. So we see plays on the ESPN highlights, highlight reels every night that are greater than anything that occurred in any season in our youth. And yet, for many of us, the game feels worse. So if the players are better and the game feels worse, what's going on here? So let's set the stage. Uh, end of the 1918 season. Red Sox have just won their fourth World Series in the last seven seasons. Babe Ruth has established himself as one of the best left-handed pitchers in baseball. Um, he comes into the 1919 season. Uh, there was a poll, I believe it was in the sporting news of managers who the majority of them voted for Ruth remaining a pitcher. He had other ideas. Tell us where Babe's head was coming into the 1919 season. James. Oh, me? Okay. His head was, I want more money. That's where he was. Also, he, of course, was, you know, throwing pianos in lakes in Sudbury, as we all know, causing all of New England to go dark for 86 years. I did find the guy who actually found the piano at, 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 on the lake at Willis Pond, but um, uh, he wanted, he had signed a contract for 10000 a year for what, three years? Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, he suddenly realized his own worth. One of the things about him that I think is often misunderstood or, or underappreciated, he had a very good head for marketing and a very acute sense of his worth to baseball and to the ownership. And he knew he was being underpaid, and he was. And so he starts agitating. He held out. The Red Sox took a boat down to spring training that year. He missed the boat because he was busy holding out. And, um, you know, he just, and then he went to Tampa and hit that home run that, you know, people still talk about. Tampa still claims it's the longest home run ever, even though the marker was in the wrong place. And um, it's all right. You know, who cares? It's baseball. It's baseball, right. Um, we'll never know which was his longest home run, and that's just fine by me. So he wanted more money and he wanted to hit. As, as Mike Rizzo, and we don't quote him too liberally in Washington at the moment, but as Mike Rizzo said, you know, he was the best left-handed pitcher in the major leagues, and he said, screw it, I'd rather hit. And, and, and so he did. Um, and, you know, in the process, completely revolutionized the game. He made it the game that is recognizable today. And uh, from, you know, the time he reported in 1919 until the sale, which actually was on December 6th, the check was written on December, on December, and the contract signed on December 26. Um, until he, you know, effectuated that change, and until blessed Harry Frazee decided he needed um, to borrow 300 grand from Jacob Rupert um, more than he needed to have Babe Ruth, um, you know, Ruth was agitating to get out of here. So, John, give us some context. Jane talks about Babe holding out. Uh, what kind of leverage did a player have uh, at that time in terms of uh, being paid the way he thought he should be paid? The only leverage a player had was to demand a trade, which is the equivalent of a toddler saying no, and, or um, to hold out. Now, there are, there are men who held out entire seasons forcing the club to get rid of them, Ed Rausch being such a person, Frank Baker, home run Baker being another but it's a really terrible form of leverage. 
The reserve clause came in in 1879. It was an old thing. And when it first came in, it was used for only five players on a team. And those five players were really happy to be reserved because it meant that they were guaranteed of employment the following year. By the end of the 1880s, major league clubs were reserving all of their players, which had the effect of not only putting shackles around their, their legs in terms of mobility, but also flattened uh, salaries. So the reserve clause was stronger than Babe Ruth. He could not have forced the trade. He could not have uh, compelled uh, the Red Sox to sell him to another club. It was the odd conjunction of Ruth's wish to have more money and Harry Frizee's sudden desperation because he had leveraged himself. Now this may sound familiar to those of you who read the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, LLCs. He had a variety of companies, many of which were going broke, some of which were going broke in part because Frizee was being paid directly for his household expenses out of the LLCs. Does this sound familiar yet? Um, <laughs> Harry Frizee. He was turned down for that, that, that uh, bank loan from Deutsche Bank, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes, clearly I was being too subtle. <laughs> <laughs> so Frizee, who had bought the Red Sox in part because 1916 had been a spectacular year on Broadway for him and gave him false enthusiasm, was wrecked by the war. Broadway went dark. His plays didn't hit. He had notes and obligations. He had bought the Red Sox on a wing and a prayer and had interest payments he couldn't make. So the desperation that Frizee felt combined with Ruth's wish to get out of there beautifully for Harry Frizee. Frizee managed to evade all of his financial responsibilities courtesy of the guaranteed $300,000 note the Yankees mortgaged Fenway Park for him. That's what it came down to. The Yankees were the owners of Fenway Park. They could call in the note any time. And um, Frizee got out of this deal at the end um, with clean hands. Ruth got out of this deal by becoming a superstar in New York. Baseball became more popular than ever, and America is a great place. <laughs> so, so who came up with the short end of the stick? The Boston Red Sox. <laughs> so Lee, for, for a generation that grew up with Manny being Manny, what did it mean for the babe being babe? Well, I don't know. He, he, I mean, Jane's book, uh, and I think it's, it's general thought that he was the first huge celebrity in America. I mean, he, was, he just became huge, and, and New York was just waiting for him. You know, they had a billion newspapers, and, and he, he was just loud, and he, he was everything that you thought your superstar should be. I, I've tried to figure out who he corresponds to in, in modern day stuff. And the closest I get is someone like Charles Barkley or some, you know, some just outrageous out, out of, I don't know, just it dominates a room. But I, but I think he's, he was bigger than all of them. I think he was just, um, he was just huge. I agree, I think he was a ticker tape parade every <laughs> year. If you can imagine, Lindbergh had a pretty good 1927, and as did the Babe. <laughs> but uh, Babe, as did Chaplin. As did Chaplin. Babe yeah. kept going. So the thing, that, just to elaborate on what you said, John, about the sale, this this fabulous economist Michael Halpert um, found at the Hall of Fame in 2000 all the Yankee um, account books and ledgers, which had been donated to the Hall by Jacob Rupert uh, in his will, but. They had arrived in 1973 after a certain Yankee owner had declared that they were of no interest to him. And um, <laughs> they appeared, apparently were not of much interest to anybody at the Hall of Fame either because nobody had opened them or even officially accessioned them when Michael found them in a storage closet. And he was given permission to photocopy them. Um, and he has spent the better part of the last almost 20 years analyzing all these numbers. And 
for me, this was a godsend. First of all, I can't add, so it was very helpful to have him around. But he had all the statistics to show exactly what the Yankees paid him, what they fined him, what they paid the private eyes to tail him, what they charged for Helen and then Claire Ruth to travel with him, what they made on concessions off of him after Yankee Stadium opened in 1923, having been paid a flat fee of 8,000 at the Polo Grounds by the Giants. Uh, what the, they made in uh, road trips, uh, where you got a flat 20%, uh, the visiting team got a flat 20%, and he was able to look at these figures of the, of the sale. So look at it this way. First of all, the New York Times, believe it or not, um, published fake news when they announced that the sale was for 125,000. It was not, it's in the contract that somebody just showed me a few minutes ago. It was 100,000, 25,000 a year at what percent interest, anybody know? 6% interest. Frazy then, who is allegedly not broke, um, then goes and borrows 300 grand from Jacob Rupert. Now understand, they were friends. This was not like, you know, and, and Rupert saw that prohibition was about to go into effect and he was gonna have to find another way to make money. Not that the Yankees had been profitable up till then, they weren't. Let, let me just insert that Rupert made Knickerbocker beer. Yes, thank you. And so he knew where he, what he wasn't going to be selling at, at, you know, uh, in the ballpark anymore. So he took one look at this and he said, sure, I'll lend you 300 grand, no problem. 7% interest. So if you do the math, which again, I can't do, <laughs> basically, at the end of six years, lovely Harry had paid more to Jacob Rupert in interest than Jacob Rupert paid Harry for Babe Ruth. You guys had an owner so stupid <laughs> that <laughs> you actually, the, he actually paid the Yankees to take Babe Ruth off his hands. I would argue that Harry Frizee was nobody's fool. I, I, would, I would argue that he was not merely stupid, but supremely venal. And Supremely what? Uh, venal. Okay. That, um, Deutsche Bank. Yeah, 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 I'm going back there. <laughs> I, I will give the briefest of educations on an old phenomenon that dates to the 1890s called syndicate baseball, whereby owners of major league clubs might have majority position in more than one club at a time. The Robeson brothers in St. Louis, the Fleischmann brothers in, in Cincinnati and Philadelphia, uh, the, uh, the family whose name I've forgotten, who owned both Brooklyn and Baltimore, and they would typically move the best players from one club to another, depending upon their prospects at the gate. This was eventually ruled illegal, but continued sub rosa with minority shares. Westbrook Pegler, in 1946, who had been one of Ruth's many ghosts, suggested that Syndicate baseball was alive and well in 1919, and that, in effect, the Yankees had an ownership stake in Boston, and that Frizee was their creature willingly. It's kind of amazing, isn't it, that, that, that there was that whole idea came up that Frizee had been maligned through the years. I mean, it, his, his grandchildren were, were putting, putting that out, and there was a whole, there was a whole kind of school of thought about that. That he was identified as a Jew and yeah. was persecuted. Yeah, yes. I mean, Presbyterian, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nearly uh, Jewish, almost Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but a right. and, yeah. I mean, the, the big thing they kept saying, no, 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 net was was further down the road, you know, and and how how could the, the story be true? But that the story was that. No, 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 Net, the, 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 the first incarnation was a straight play on Broadway, and uh, that, was, that was part of the mix of the whole, the whole time there. And it became No, 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 Net, they, they put in a musical score to it. Yeah, for, yeah. Z, for Z had not had a hit on Broadway since 1916. So 1917 and 1918 were terrible for cash flow, even though probably none of his servants became unemployed. And, um, he desperately needed the money to make the interest payments on time or have Joe Lannon, the former Red Sox owner, 
sue him for failure to get out from under the note Lannan had taken to mortgage Fen Fenway Park. This really is a pyramid scheme. Yeah. And you may have mentioned it, John, but one of the reasons 1917 and 18 were so bad for theater was was a little intramural exercise uh, going on called World War I. So, uh, uh, you know, the theater was, Broadway wasn't exactly thriving in, in those years. Uh, 1919, the defending champions finish in sixth place. Uh, they had a number of injuries in the pitching staff. Uh, Ruth continued to uh, up his salary demands and uh, made it no secret that he planned to, even though he was under contract, three, he was gonna ask for more money. So at the time the deal was announced uh, officially, uh, this was the reason that uh, Frazee gave for selling Ruth to the Yankees. While Ruth, without question, is the greatest hitter the game has ever seen, he is likewise one of the most selfish and inconsiderate men that ever wore a uniform. Had he possessed the right disposition, had he been willing to take orders and work for the good of the club like the other men on the team, I never would have dared let him go. Twice during the past two seasons, Babe has jumped the club and revolted, he refused to obey orders of the manager. I give it to you, my panel. Is there a kernel of truth in there? Manny Machado is a lousy teammate. <laughs> right? He's not. He's a terrific ball player, and like a star, he acts from ego. It's going to happen. When you get somebody like Mike Trout, who seemingly is without ego and is the very best at what he does, it's an anomaly. This is sort of a, um, a thought speak that goes on to this day, doesn't it? You know, Roger Clemens leaves and mm -hmm. he's a terrible guy and, uh, and you know, whoever leaves, it's, it, oh well, you know, he really wasn't worth it anyway. It's, it's kind so of the way was, of baseball. A. Ruth was such a bad guy that as part of this deal to get rid of him, um, the Yankees did double his salary for the <laughs> last two years of the, the contract he had signed with Frazee and they got the Red Sox to pay for half the increase. <laughs> it's, all, it's all in the books. So it's should, unbelievable. Should ownership have like overlooked the fact that he jumped the team a couple of times? Uh, he would never, you know, I mean, if, if, if he got back to his room by 6 a.m., uh, that, that would have been early on his part. Uh, I mean, <laughs> is, is there any justification there? No. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, he, had, he was anti-authoritarian in his soul. You know, th this is a guy who, and I'm gonna do this really briefly because it's not about, this is not the topic of the day, who was abandoned by his parents. He was not an incorrigible, as I'm sure many of you think. He was not an orphan, as many of you have been taught. He was neither of those things, but those two myths about Babe Ruth gathered and took root in, in ignorance and lack of fact because he didn't have any interest in having anybody know the truth about his childhood, which was Dickensian. His parents divorced, his father caught his mother doing the nasty with one of his bartenders on the quote, dinging room floor, that's out of a deposition in the, in the divorce case, and they dumped him. They dumped him at this school called St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, which accepted incorrigibles and wayward boys and some orphans and some boarding students, which was Babe Ruth, a boarding student. He was not the product, he was not a runabout on the, on the, you know, the waterfront in Baltimore. He spent the, most of his first six years of his life in a very stable, working class neighborhood surrounded by aunts, uncles, and cousins. So, He's sent away to this institution. Most kids who went to St. Mary's spent a week, sometimes just a day, maybe a year. Babe Ruth would stay there, give or take, you know, with some outs, which cannot be actually factually, factually documented because all the papers from the school were burnt in a 1919 fire. Uh, and the only records that exist say he came in in, in March 1914, and, I'm sorry, sorry in, uh, on June 13th, 1902 and left in March 1914. So basically he grew up there. He was a lifer. 
He was, he was so much bigger than everybody else that people thought he was a staff member. He was gangly and weird looking and he looked different from everybody else and he was known by a, a horrible, I, I don't know how to, I, I can't abbreviate it, a horrible racial name, which would follow him from St. Mary's in the playing fields there to the Red Sox and then throughout his major league career. So he was anti-authoritarian. Was he prone to listen to anybody, tell him what to do? Absolutely not. Did he, and did, they, did he come to rue that later in life when the, when the perception of him as a reckless, self-indulgent drunkard who you know, was always out wenching, you know, was so in force the way it is with any celebrity? You collude in making an image and you, you don't ever get rid of it. You know, and this is why baseball was not in a big hurry to hire him at the end of his life when he wasn't doing that much of it or no more than any other major leaguer, I would say. So, you know, yeah, he jumped. A lot of people jumped. It was the middle of the war. The seasons were ending early. People were going off to play with steel teams. He went home to Baltimore once where, you know, to see his father who he hated. And it, it doesn't mean much to me. Does it mean much to you guys? Um, <laughs> what I think that Jane does splendidly in her book. And there are many, many wonderful things in the book, but for me the very best thing is that she details how Babe Ruth spent his entire adult life making up for a childhood he didn't have. So if he acted like a big kid without restraints, it wasn't merely because he was angry and anti-authoritarian, he was lonely. Yeah, he was just so young when he came here too. I mean. He, he became, he calmed down later in life, you know, when he got married a second time, he, 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 he had a personal trainer, they're like one of the first people to ever have a personal trainer and, and got himself in shape and uh, he was just young, young, young when he was here. It, you, you'd have the same thing in any sport, I mean, you, you, worry, about, you worry about these kids that come, out, come, come right into the NBA, you know, and they're, they're very young and uh, he was young. And I just want to add, because I think Lee, you probably, I think you touched on this in your book, but I, I, I haven't memorized it every line, but I'm pretty sure you did. It, he, when he married that waitress that he met at the coffee shop that grand first day in Boston, name was Helen Woodford, um, and she would it, it end up dying a horrible death in a house fire in Watertown in 1929. They were still married, um, but only on paper. Um, they had separated in 1925. There was a separation agreement. He had to pay her the same amount that Jacob Rupert paid her to take her <laughs> off his hands. Um, but in 19, think of this. He gets out of St. Mary's. He's freed from what was, you know, there were not guns on the roofs. There were not steel, you know, bars on the windows. Uh, kids ran away all the time, and he was one of them who ran away prolifically. But he gets out of St. Mary's, he signs with the Orioles, he's sold to the Red Sox, he pitches for the, helps pitch the Grays, the Providence Grays to a championship, hitting his first professional home run, you know, and then he gets married in October. You know, and what he was doing, in my view, was trying to give himself the family he never had. His first instinct was not that of a glutton and a runaround and a wanton womanizer. He didn't know what was out there for him, and when he figured it out, yeah, he had plenty of experience and fun doing it. But his first instinct was to conform and was to try to create that which he had never had. I went to a Catholic boys' high school. I've been trying to recover ever since. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> so, so front page news. In, in both Boston and New York, and probably in much of the country, when Ruth is sold. Uh, what filter did the media interpret this deal through? Was it, was it homogeneous, or, or, or were there uh, conflicting uh, interpretations of, of the sale? I think it was all over the all over the map. I think I think there were some people who took who took the um, the Red Sox point of view and the Harry Frazee, We're getting rid of a bad guy. We're going to build up the team, you know. And uh, 
but it, it, very soon it, it, it seemed to fall apart, that, that line of thinking, because uh, more players were heading south, you know, along with the Babe. And, uh, Harry you sold know. a lot of guys off to the Yankees. A actually, uh, actually yeah. there was a predecessor sale from, right. from Boston Carl to New Mays, York, yeah. the Carl Mays incident, right. Right. which is little studied today, but this was a submarine pitcher of the first rank who no longer wanted to play in Boston. And uh, he was suspended for not showing up to games by American League President Ben Johnson. The Red Sox then sold Mays to the Yankees for 40,000 bucks. Mays was only too happy to go to New York. Johnson voided the sale. The Yankees brought the American League president to court to obtain an injunction. This was really the end of Ben Johnson's career of dominance uh, because uh, everyone was looking for a commissioner for next year. First, they, they started looking at uh, former Chief Justice and President Taft. Finally, they settled on an old hack named Landis. Um, but the Carl Mays incident revealed that Ben Johnson had been losing control for years. In fact, when Lannan sold the Red Sox to Harry Frazee in 1916, that was the very first time that a franchise had been transferred in the American League without Ben Johnson's not only approval, but managing it. I, I would remind those who think the Yankees themselves began not in 1903, but in 1901 with Baltimore, that it's not so. The Baltimore franchise was exploded deliberately. The franchise reverted to the league. Ben Johnson created the Yankees. In a way, he created the Red Sox as well. One of the things about the newspapers, Gordon, that, that's to me the most significant, and yes, I looked at the coverage in Boston and New York, and in New York, gee, surprisingly, New York was happy about the deal. Um, <laughs> but what was most significant was the Daily News, the first tabloid in America, had begun publication in June of 1919. The back page was invented by uh, short-term managing editor Arthur Clark, who had been a sports writer in Omaha. And in November of, of 1919, they started slowly getting readers ready for the back page by covering dog shows and things like that. It took them about a week to start doing real sports competition. There was a lot of college football. But when Babe Ruth arrives in New York, you know, what's on the back page and the front page of the Daily News? Here's the babe. With, and there's, the pictures are very, he fills two thirds of the page as he would for the rest of his Yankee career. I mean, um, Marshall Hunt, who covered him for the Daily News, basically said he cut, filled two thirds of every afternoon paper in New York, uh, you know, for, for 14 years. I mean, you wrote that, that Marshall Hunt wasn't assigned to cover the Yankees. I mean, Babe Ruth became his beat, right? Yeah. Well, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you talk to him? No, he, he was gone, but I, I had some tapes from him. Yeah, from, yeah, I had the same tapes, right. You know, um, you know he was an interesting guy in himself, just, just covering the babe day after day. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of like there's, there's a guy in Toronto that covers Trump every day and kind of kind of counts out all the mis mistakes he makes and, and writes it on, online now. Marshall Hunt was kind of the... The, the guy from Toronto covering or, Trump. Or, or like the uh, Japanese reporters who don't report on the Angels, but report on Otani. Yeah. Or, or previously uh, Ichiro, right? It was the beginning of 24-7 coverage. And tabloid news profoundly, and, and headlines, profoundly changed the way people read sports, perceived sports, and the amount that was written about sports specifically in predominantly baseball, then boxing and college football. I mean, this was a wild change. This was not just the golden era, quote unquote, of sports writing. It was a golden era of newspapers, which would come to a, you know, which would begin to decline in numbers of pages printed and numbers of papers around the country as radio would start to, to take um, preeminence. But when Babe comes to New York, it, 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 it is a, confluence of an incredible number of perfect um, facts. It's the beginning of radio, it's the beginning of tabloids, it's the beginning of PR, it's the beginning of marketing. Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee are figuring out ways to 
do marketing strategies and, and photo ops and all kinds of stuff that's still going on today. And among the many things uh, Babe Ruth did first, hire a trainer, Artie McGovern, at the urging of the Yankees and the agent that, that Babe Ruth hired, who's a guy named Christy Walsh, who was the first sports agent. He was the first Jerry Maguire. So Ruth was the first guy to um, create and establish the principle that an athlete should be paid, a professional athlete should be paid as an entertainer, not just for his deeds on the field, but for the people he brought to the field. And that is a profound and radical shift that is still you know, paying you know, LeBron a lot of money. Yeah. So for, for, for me, that begs the question then, this. Uh, even though Babe Ruth was acknowledged and regarded as a great player while he was here in Boston, would he have become Babe Ruth had he spent the rest of his career in Boston? I don't think so. Nope. Yeah, I don't think so either. Wasn't big enough. Sorry, guys. You weren't big enough for him. <laughs> <laughs> he would have become Ted Williams, you know. I mean, he, yeah. he, 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 he wouldn't have been this outsized figure. They couldn't have built the, you know, the house that Ruth built. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he would have been a more intellectual kind of guy. Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. he, he would have stopped off at the historical society. Yeah. I was with I was with a biographer, a friend of mine from J School last night, Eileen McNamara, who of course was at yeah. the Globe for years and had a lot to do when won a Pulitzer for commentary and had a lot to do with the coverage of the Catholic Church here. And she's like talking about how a biographer has to really read all the correspondence and the papers and the diaries. And I'm going, yeah, well, there was the one letter he wrote to a mistress the day he <laughs> married Claire. But other than that, yeah. there wasn't a hell of a lot. See, see, that's the difference with doing a sports biography. You know, they're, they're not men of letters. They're not, they're not people. You know, if you do a, a, a biography of Winston Churchill, you know, you, you've got, you've got I, I mean, Robert Caro, I've, I've read about him and going. He'd, going do, he'd do a Ruth biography in a week. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he, he, he goes to the LBJ library and, and, you know, goes through eight billion letters and things, you know, and you get the one letter from the babe. So at the beginning of this, and I was very dubious about doing this, in part because of that guy over there, his book is so terrific. And I thought, you know, what, what can I possibly do? after Lee and after Bob Creamer and then Marshall Smelser and, you know, blah, blah, Hal Wagenheim at all. So I read all of those books, you know, very carefully and annotated them um, before deciding to do it. And the one thing that was really clear to me was that the first 20 years of his life were basically missing. And that's because it was a story Babe Ruth didn't want to tell and didn't want to have told. And the difference between you and me with his decade, right, basically, in writing. So, and in that time, documents that you couldn't have found, you know, unless you had spent, you know, 25 years reading yeah. every edition of the, Boston, uh, the Baltimore Sun, you know, I could find with a click of a mouse. Because once Babe's daughter, Julia, recently deceased at age 102, it let, let free with the notion that Babe's parents, George and Kate, had separated, which she whispered. Um, uh, you know, all I had to do was type in George Herman Ruth Sr. V, that was my big contribution, V, Katie Ruth, and up pops this whole divorce, um, 150 pages of documents. Lee couldn't have found out, no matter what. I mean, you, you, you'd still be looking. There, they, that, that technology didn't exist when you were writing your book. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, nobody wants to do a book on Babe Ruth. It's the publishers who kind of kind of come to you and yeah, say, exactly. You, you know, I mean, they, they came to me and I said, well, this guy Robert Creamer has right. written this biography that everybody says is the greatest. But but my editor, um, who, who was also the editor for this Dan Brown guy who wrote this book, uh, <laughs> uh, Da Vinci Code, he, he he has an eye towards this stuff, and he said, you know, he said, I'm I'm like. 45 years old or something like that. He said, I've never read Bob Creamer's book and I never will. And none of my friends will read it either. He said, a new book will bring us into the game. 
And so I write it, and, and I think it's like 14 years so between, 14. between when I wrote it and you wrote it. And Babe Ruth is kind of like, um, like Abraham Lincoln of sports. You know, you can keep going back. You know, there'll be somebody who's going to write the book, Babe Ruth is a vampire, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's just a subject that, that is still there and still there and still there. Well, I mean, it, it, partly you're right. Somebody will find yet another angle on him. Um, I have no doubt about it, and that they'll find mistakes other than the misspelling of Buck O'Neill, and there are some others in there. But they've been corrected, I promise you. Um, uh, the thing is that history is being rewritten every day thanks to the availability of digitized collections of newspapers and of family documents. And so I'm sure somebody's going to go out and find something and they'll come to me and they'll say, Levy, you got this wrong, because they'll have more information than I could get access to. And that's just part of the game you have to be not only ready to accept, but embrace, because why shouldn't it be improved upon if it can be? We can't have this panel discussion in Boston without raising the topic of the curse of the Bambino. Yeah. <laughs> and in the house is the man whose friend actually came up with the term because he included it in his autobiography. He did scribe. not come up with the term. All right, well, George well, Vesey of the New York Times came no, up with the term. We're going to let no, Bob no, Ryan tell the story. No, oh, you no, Bob, no, no, no. <laughs> Come on, Bob. Oh, oh, oh I'm Sean killing you. <laughs> I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that? You didn't ask. Yeah, I did. <laughs> the truth, as I know it, is that no one knows where it came from. And that it has fallen into the general uh, discourse. I'll tell you how I first heard about it. And it, to me, it is the same category as, well, I, used, I grew up hearing so I'm looking at the age here. You, most of you grew up hearing that dirty jokes all emanated in a prison. And they spread to the general population. But nobody knows this to be true. OK. Circa 1984, I was down in Situate uh, having a pleasant afternoon at the home of a uni very Unitarian Universalist minister named Daryl Berger. He was, a, he was the college friend of a friend of mine, that's how we met, Henry Hecht fine sports writer for the New York Post. And Henry and I were friends, and Henry came to Boston, and, and uh, he introduced my wife, Elaine, and I, and me, to Daryl. In the course of wandering around Daryl's property with his wonderful dog, Doc, Daryl asked me if I've ever heard about this concept of the curse of the Bambino. And as he heard it, it was as follows. The curse of the Bambino uh, the, the Red Sox sale of Babe Ruth to the Yankees was an original sin from which there could be no absolution. <laughs> Hence the curse of the Bambino. I don't know where he heard it, but I assure you George Vesey wrote it after that. He did not hear it from, I don't know where he heard it, he, but he did not come up with it. Now, and, and my good great friend Shaughnessy has made a, a tire living putting future Shaughnessy's in, you know, the college and, and houses on the Riviera and everything else, you know, based on the curse of the Bambino. He didn't come up with it. George Vesey didn't come up with it. I don't know who came up with it, but I'm telling you right now that it wasn't George Vesey. And no one knows who it was, but, and Daryl Berger, who we would hope to actually get here today, but Daryl Berger heard this, and, and this, so uh, that's all I know. But that's where I first heard it. And that, that's the concept. There was an original sin from which there could be no absolution. <laughs> Thank you. If, it, in, it, in the small uh, world category, yeah, extraordinarily, John Thorne and Daryl Berger are friends. Are friends. So Daryl told me the story in email of how he <laughs> initiated the phrase, the curse of the Bambino. Not only the concept, but the phrase. And you didn't tell me that either. <laughs> I was too busy misspelling O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> so Daryl sends me an email, and uh, we, have a, we have an exchange. And I said, Daryl, this is great stuff. I didn't know this. Um, would you mind if I used these emails to construct a little piece for our game. Our game is my thrice-weekly blog. I'm not good, but I am prolific. 
Um, if you wish to know Daryl's story, go to ourgame.mlblogs.com and in the search box put in Daryl Berger. It'll pop right up and there's the story of the curse of the Bambino. Well, I have two things. One, my mother was Henry Heck's fourth grade teacher. No so way. In New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and two, Shaughnessy, who, who made the, 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 the thing the famous, yeah. said, said that his book editor. She made it up, she, and her grandfather her, made it up. Her, her, no, her, his book editor said, why don't we call this the curse of the Bambino? Yes, yeah. but she so, attributed it to her grandfather, who told it to her while they were watching Fireflies. At night, I actually wrote a piece about this for ESPN last October, and because I found the guy who located the piano on a little inlet place on, on Willis Lake, a guy named Charlie Barry, who had discovered it with his brother while blueberry picking back in the 60s, and it was actually intact, and you could actually play a couple of notes of the piano, and. Um, <laughs> Count it out. <laughs> there are the notes. <laughs> we can, now move into double through. jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's an Italian angle to this story, too. I believe it's called The Curse of the Gambinos. <laughs> <laughs> so I assure you that Bob Ryan was not a plant in the audience. He came of his own volition, did not know he was being called upon, but. Um, I think we've all been enlightened a little bit on, on the curse of the Bambino. I want to give the audience uh, uh, the opportunity to, to direct a few questions uh, toward our panel. Yes, sir. Uh, probably the biggest name that we've all known in recent years is David Ortiz. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, he It might have extended his career because he was really not a very good outfielder in his last three or four years. And for a long time, though he claimed that he always played the Sunfield in the 1920s, by the mid-20s he was shifted away from the Sunfield. Other questions? I thought I remember reading that Babe Ruth hit more home runs than any team in 1920 that his individual totals were more than any team. Is it possible to assess the extent to which he was better than everybody as opposed to playing a different sort of game, which is he was trying to do something different from what everybody else was doing? Uh, I will say that the all-out swing that I referred to much earlier this afternoon uh, was one that he borrowed from Joe Jackson. Jackson and Ruth were the only two who would swing all out. And um, Ruth in 1918, as I said, was persuaded to go more scientifically to the opposite field to his detriment, he felt. So I think he, A, he was playing a different game, and B, he was better than everybody else. Well, the big thing now, too, is launch angle. They always talk launch angle, launch angle, and swinging up at the ball. He was one of the few guys that swung up at the ball because when he was at St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, Brother Matthias, who was a, a big, a, a big Zaverian brother, was kind of the, the dean of discipline and this this cool guy. And he would go out in the early evenings and he would hit fungos to to, to all these kids and he would hit them high, high in the air and the kids would go running. And and he wanted to swing and, and, and hit like Brother Matthias. So he had he had that whole concept going. Uh, before Babe came along, a, a home run was a mistake. Um, people didn't try to hit, hit, hit fly balls. They, they tried to hit hard grounders through the infield, uh, line drives. Um, and the debate continues today whether you should swing up or swing down. And the other thing about him that was astonishingly modern was his understanding uh, of, of how his body moved in space and what he was trying to do. If you look at all the different stances that he had and ways he positioned his feet, he was deliberately imitating Joe Jackson, and they talked about it, and he, he certainly admitted that he was doing it. Um, you know, Jackson would actually measure from the you know, line of the, of, the um, of, of home plate 
where his feet would go. He actually, and there's a 1949 story in Sport where he discussed this, and Babe Ruth aped that. He didn't actually use the, you know, didn't actually measure it the way Joe Jackson did. But he, sometimes he turned his feet like this because he understood that the more he turned his body, torque. the more torque and rotation, the leverage of turning his hips into the ball, you know, was going to create more power. So while a lot of what he said, and this was also makes it hard to quote him, was ghostwritten, <laughs> um, the, the times in which he discussed how he hit a ball and what he was trying to do, and that are in his own words, are remarkable. You know, it's probably uh, not fair to indulge in historical hypotheticals, but I, I'm just curious how the three of you uh, feel about how Babe would have been able to handle this age of social media. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might have flourished. You know, I think, you know, he's, a, he's an outgoing guy, and, a, a, you know, I, I, I mean, what people wrote about him never bothered him, really. I mean, he kind of just blew right through things. And I, I think he would have been a social media star. Even in the age of TMZ, which you know, is, is well, dedicated to the well, proposition of if you can find a celebrity in well, a compromising position, go for it? Well, he might have had a few problems, too. <laughs> <laughs> he did, he did, you know, Christy Walsh or whoever his agent would have been would have had people tra trailing him. He wouldn't have been going into regular bars or speakeasies. He'd be, you know, in the VIP rooms. And uh, he'd have handlers handling him as much as Babe Ruth was able to be handled. And, you know, the, see, the, the truth is, just like with Mickey Mantle, people didn't hate him for the stuff he did. They envied him for they the stuff he did that he got away <laughs> with. They, in Mantle's case, they didn't know about it. Well, yeah, they during, they, during his playing career? After, after the uh, after the nightclub? After the Copa Cabana. Uh, after the maybe. Copa in 1957, I think people knew what was going on. I'm picking up on the gentleman's question on the home runs. Uh, is it true that, uh, well, I know mean, no Ty Cobb disdained home runs. But, uh, is it true that Cobb despised Babe Ruth personally, or was it just an artistic dispute that he had about this whole home run business? I'm curious, what do you think, Lee? Because mm -hmm. I've heard, you get different reactions yeah. to it. You know, some people say, oh, well, they became golfing buddies and friends. I don't buy it. I don't, I don't buy the revisionist take that, that uh, Ty Cobb was not the horrible racist <laughs> that everybody knew him to be. Um, uh, I don't think they much liked each other. And, uh, I, mean, I, I think they were kind of stepping on each other's celebrity. You know, I, I think Ty Cobb was bothered by that. Ty Cobb was jealous. Dimaggio was jealous of Mantle. Yeah, I, I think Cobb's style went the way of the dodo, and he resented that. Now, there's a big move the last decade or so of Cobb apologists who will say that he mellowed in, re, in his later years, and then they try to take that mellowing and make it retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> but Cobb was roundly hated by his own teammates. And there was, there was a fight on the field at, at Navin Park? Yeah. There was a fight. Um, the Tigers and the Yankees did not like each other, and it was built around the Cobb and, and Ruth having much antipathy. And there was a game where the Yankees ended up winning 9-0. It was a forfeit um, when, it, when they got into it on the field. And it was, it was ugly, and it was rude, and, um, and I think it was very personal, Bob. I, 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 uh, is there any estimate of uh, Babe Ruth's velocity of his fastball? And what did Ruth think of Ted Williams? You mean his, his pitching velocity? No, I've never, I've I, never I seen that. I don't think they had the mind. jugs gun back then. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I think his whole pitching philosophy was, was a fastball up and in, curveball down no, and no away, way. which is which is kind of the, the, the way everybody pitches now. I think um, it's safe to say that in the 1910s, the only person regularly throwing a fastball over 92 or 93 miles an hour was Walter Johnson. Ruth was not as fast as Johnson. No one ever made that comparison. So he beat him a lot. Yes. 
Kevin, we have a question up here too. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question about um, Babe's national fame after he got traded, uh, sold to the Yankees. Um, versus was was most of the fame of those ball players like Walter Johnson, Smokey Joe Wood, people like that, um, Christy Mathewson. Was it more regional in nature? H how, or was it more national for those guys? Were they as, where were they in relation to who Babe Ruth became? So were yeah were were other players? Did they enjoy the national celebrity that Babe Ruth? would gain? I, I think you have to look at it um, in the context of technology and um, circula newspaper circulation, for example. Fame was local when Babe Ruth arrived in Boston in 1914. It was as big as the circulation of the daily newspapers. There was, remember, no radio. What you learned about a hero was after the fact, and depending where you lived, it was, it was that much more after the fact. And and the two sporting women, thank you. But it, it was, generally speaking, local. And then what began to happen, thanks to things that happened during, you know, a technological improvements that happened during the war and immediately thereafter, with, you know, again, you know, there was a, there was a, the first fax machine was developed in 1924. The first overnight ability to send a wire photo, though expensive, was 1924. So Babe comes along just at a moment when it is possible, as people did, send a picture of his mistress overnight from New York to, to Chicago and New York to Los Angeles in August 1925. That is a whole different ball game than the, the fame that those other guys had. Exactly right. Yes, sir. What I found out recently that amazed me was how uh, famous Casey Stengel was when he played in the teens, in the early 20s, and almost rivaling Cobb, even though he was an ordinary player. Then they talk about Babe Ruth hanging Milla Huggins off the back of a train that was moving. So that showed you what the Babe thought of Milla Huggins and authoritarianism. Then Casey was managing the Yankees and didn't get along very well with Joe DiMaggio. So I'm wondering what you folks might think how Casey and the Babe, as manager Casey and player Babe, might have got along together because there's a lot of authoritarianism and anti-authoritarianism in those two figures. I, I think anybody trying to manage the babe would have been in trouble. I think, <laughs> I think he knew his stature. And um, the, the funny thing with Miller Huggins, Miller Huggins was a very small man, and the babe always had a ser somewhat of an antipathy towards small people um, and kind of put them down, um, like the Randy Newman song, I guess. Um, but he, he, um, and he, he never, he never gave Miller Huggins the, the credit Miller Huggins deserved. Miller Huggins, Miller Huggins was the guy that came up to him <clears throat> and told him that the deal had gone, had, had gone down between the, the, the Red Sox and the Yankees. He, he went all the way out to California to tell him. And uh, the first thing Miller Huggins said, hey, you're going to play in the field. You're not going to pitch anymore. And I mean, Miller Huggins kind of delivered the future to the babe. Do you think he really hung him out to dry on the train? I don't, I've never found confirmation of that. <coughs> no. I don't, I think it's one of those boobamisters. <laughs> one of those what? Boobamisters? A, a boobamister. So it's a good, it's a tale that your grandmother would tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of drinking in baseball though at that it time. Was a lot. You know, there was a lot of drink. Exactly. I mean, the, the whole deal here, the Harry Frazee deal and, and everybody was a drinker and, and I'm, I'm sure there was drinking involved when this deal was made. It wasn't, it, it wasn't between my lawyer and your lawyer and, and three lawyers. It was, it was these guys getting drunk at night. In the 1910s, the sporting set, when you refer to someone as a sportsman, you didn't mean that he had a horse uh, racing at Belmont. 
you me it meant gambling. And the sporting set consisted of baseball owners, gamblers, theater owners and producers, and Jews. This is one of the reasons that I su suspect Glenn Stout and Dick Johnson rode their anti-Semitic hobby horse as long as they did in trying to explain away the Harry Frizee uh, legend. Now, I say, I, as a Jew, I'm allowed to say that Jews had this reputation as being involved in gambling and boxing and drinking and anything, anything that was in the organized crime way. Uh, Jews had their day in the sun in, this, in these uh, areas in the 1910s and were taken over by other ethnic groups in the years to come. But Arnold Rothstein, whom you, you'll recognize the name, as the man who fixed the 1919 World Series, was a friend of Frizee's, was involved in theatrical productions, ran a billiard room with John McGraw. They had equal shares in the El Oriente racetrack in Havana. So the whole idea that gambling intruded itself into baseball in a surprising way in 1919 <laughs> is very nuts. <laughs> Um, I would say it, 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 it's probably a safe assumption on my part, uh, just by your presence here, uh, that you're demonstrating your love of baseball. And I trust and hope that you agree with me that for those of us who love the game the way we do, could we have spent a better afternoon than in the company of these three folks, <laughs> Lee Monfeld, John Thorne, Jane Levy, thank you so much, and thank you all. Thank you.